Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a show and tell that is about, it's about 29 years old. Uh, back when I first moved to San Francisco, which is the summer of 1990, uh, I showed up and I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a sculptor. And I, I was an artist and a sculptor. And I did a ton of art and I showed it in group shows all over the Bay Area. Uh, in the early 90s, the Bay Area was a phenomenal city for smaller gallery shows. There, there was a lot of opportunity for young artists to get their work shown. Um, this was not the case in New York when I was living there. Uh, in New York in the 80s, if you wanted to get your work shown by a small gallery, sometimes you had to wait um, months or more than a year just to get an interview to have your slides looked at. I think one of the, the entry level places I remember back then was called White Columns and it was six or eight months just to get an interview to look at your stuff. Um, look, cities like New York and LA and Chicago, hyper competitive places. Uh, and so that follows that it can be difficult to get exposure in a city like that. And San Francisco was less competitive. There were a lot of small galleries and they were all looking for people to put stuff in. Actually, here's how hard it was to get my work shown in New York in the 80s. I actually opened my own gallery with 19 friends. I think there were 20 of us. Maybe it was only 10. I can't quite remember. I think it might've been 10, eight, six. Anyway, we opened up a cooperative gallery on First Avenue and First Street in the old Little Ricky store. Uh, in Manhattan and ran it for a year. It was called Points of Departure. That's how hard it is to get your work shown in New York. We just opened our own gallery. But I moved to San Francisco and there were a ton of small galleries, the Nelson Morales Gallery, Art Attack Gallery. And I started getting my work shown a lot and I started submitting it to other uh, traveling shows. The art critic for the Big Guardian at the time, Harry Roach was a fan and an early uh, uh, promoter of my work. Uh, and so I showed my work in a lot of different places. And I also showed a, a wide variety of work, everything from fantastical weird guns to armor to uh, what looked like decrepit robot hands. And one of the things I was particularly fascinated by was helmets. Um, and I was then, as I am now, still interested in the way helmets can change the way you see. I like putting on, I like putting on VR goggles and looking at the pass-through. I like the way in which it alters the world and projects a picture of the world on the drawing of the world that it's made. And it turns out that I've always liked that. Uh, and so I designed a helmet in, I think, 1992 based on this desire. Uh, I have to grab one prop here to show you something. What, 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 why isn't it there? I thought I'd put this thing over there, but I didn't. All right, I'm missing something. Brazil. I know it doesn't seem like a, 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 a regular leap to go from what I was just talking about to the country, Brazil, but it's not. The movie is what I'm talking about, Terry Gilliam's film. And in Terry Gilliam's film, Brazil, there are a ton of Fresnel lenses. Uh, Fresnel lens is a specific type of lens. I won't go into it right now. It's got a cool origin story. It's Frenchman used in lighthouses. Um, but you could buy small Fresnel lenses and put them on the back of your van and they would help you be able to see like a wide angle through your rear view mirror. And the Exploratorium uh, sold Fresnel lenses like this one here. This, this is a Fresnel lens. And I bought one from the Exploratorium and I mounted it into a helmet. Now, this is, yeah. So <laughs> this is not the final product. This is a great example of me, the young engineer going way too far. Right, like, okay, so I welded this steel cage for my head, and then I welded these side pieces, and then I welded an entire circle and put uh, eight bolts all the way around the perimeter and lined them up with the holes in this. What a freaking nightmare. That, that is a lot of work to do. I mean, it's, it's pretty, sure, but it's also a lot easier if you just do it like this. <laughs> this was design number two, just a couple of clips, and you can put in the Fresnel lens, there you go. And now there's two things that happen that are really cool when you put this on. One is that your head gets really small. Yeah, my head's like the size of an orange. Here, wait, I think it's even better if you do it like this. There we go, yeah. Okay, so this is one cool thing. Wow, look at that. If that's our thumbnail, no one's going to what is, what, 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 what is that? <laughs> okay, so 
This is the cool thing, is that to the rest of the world, your head looks like it's the size of an orange, right? It's very, ooh, ah, okay, I, I, hold on. Just put that anywhere. Um, the second cool thing is that I actually see better through this lens without my glasses than with my glasses. It, like, it's the lens itself is almost my prescription. So on Halloween, the, the, the year that I built this, I just wore this to a party. And I went as like a guy whose head had been shrunken. But the really weird thing was after you wear this for like a couple of hours and you're walking around the world, the world starts to feel normal again. Like you start to be able to make out what's going on. Whereas in the first time you wear this, I mean, I think, let me see if you guys can get a sense of what this feels like. Yeah, right? It's like the whole world is a wide angle lens. Yeah, it, it, it can be disconcerting at first, but two hours into a Halloween party, I was having a great time and there were no illegal drugs involved whatsoever. Um, so this, I ended up calling it the distortion helmet. Uh, and I put it in a gallery show and, uh, and wrote a statement about it because yeah, the transformational power. I was thinking about the transformational power of things that you can wear back then, not realizing that that same fascination would lead all the way to spacesuits and armor and cosplay and the reality I am currently living within. But this is one of the earliest incarnations of that fascination, my distortion helmet. Uh, yeah. Uh, I I'm not sure where I can get these specific lenses anymore, but if I can find them, or if you know where I can get them, and I, you can't even search for no lenses by their angle of refraction, by by the type of like lens action you can get out of it. I mean, I guess if you're talking to the factory, you might, but certainly not to any web page online. Um, this is a really cool thing. I wearing it is a unique experience, and looking at someone in it is a unique experience. So. It's an object of still great fascination for me. Thank you guys for taking this little trip down memory lane with me through the early 90s in San Francisco. I will see you guys next time. Ooh. Oh yeah, there we go. Ooh, I'm getting a kind of a more. Oh yeah. All right, I think I can turn it off now. Thanks for watching that video. If you want to support us, one of the best ways you can do it is going to our merch store and purchasing one of our beautiful new posters. This one right here is called Elevations of Bear. And this is a, uh, a compendium of 16 pages from my sketchbook when I was actively building my bear costume for San Diego Comic-Con a few years ago. What did I do with a bear costume at Comic-Con? I dragged around the carcass of Leo DiCaprio reversing things. Now this might be enough information for you to build your own bear costume, or you could just frame it and hang it in your house. Each poster is printed on a really lovely tactile heavy cardstock. Get your own by following the links below.